Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Can I have your attention, please? Can I have your attention, please? Thank you. All right, we're going to get started. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for attending this panel. It's been a it's been a long day, so we really do appreciate you sticking around and, and, and attending this last panel of the day about electrical transmission deep dive and coordinating all the solutions. So my name is Mike Getfal, and I'm a senior uh, manager at um, EDF Renewables, and I manage all the offshore interconnection for EDF Renewables, but I spend most of my time for a joint venture that we have with Shell uh, New Energy that's called Atlantic Shores that you may know. Um, so a little bit about uh, EDF Renewables. Um, it's a subsidiary of EDF Group uh, that has about 165 employees. Um, and one of the subsidiaries of um, EDF Group is EDF Renewables, but I'm part of EDF Renewables North America. So what we do is we have four divisions. Um, one is a grid scale power, which I belong to. And uh, we develop and execute a large scale projects. So it goes wind onshore and offshore but also solar and battery storage and then we have the other division that I'm not going to go uh, through today because uh, today's panel is focused on offshore wind but um, uh, as a developer we are also very focused on growth so um, we do have two joint ventures so one is Atlantic Shores um, with um, between EDF Renewables and Shell it's the 50-50 joint venture and that's a generation uh, developer and we have three leases on the east coast and that has a potential of five gigawatt of offshore wind and as a matter of fact last year in June we were awarded um, the single largest project in New Jersey to develop 1.5 gigawatt of offshore wind um, to feed uh, homes and, and industries in, uh, in New Jersey. And we still have more to develop with a newly acquired lease on the bite. We also have another joint venture with Shell New Energy that's called uh, Mid-Atlantic Offshore Development. And that's a transmission developer that recently got awarded um, a project under the state agreement approach uh, that was done under the BPU as well. And that goes very well with our coordinating transmission. So this, this subject is very timely and very relevant to us. So as a developer, as you know, interconnection is one of those um, major uh, uh, key uh, challenges that we, we face every day because uh, as we develop offshore wind uh, and all that power generated, it's useless if we can't connect it to the grid in a safe, reliable, and also cost-efficient way with having in mind um, the environment that we're impacting to. So making sure that the corridors we use onshore and offshore are minimizing impact on the wildlife, but also in the communities that we serve and, and we, we, we touch. So today Today's panel um, has uh, different experts, so we have five uh, experts today that are ranging from academia, uh, R&D, uh, the industry, but today we're going to start with uh, Rajib Dada. Uh, he's a chief engineer, Power Electronics at GE Global Research, uh, and um, he has, he's leading a project with uh, now RDC that's called DC Collection and Transmission for Offshore Wind Farms. So without further ado, please help me welcome Rajib. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Okay, uh, so this is actually a project that we are just finishing up. We started, uh, th this was very kind of a short duration project, short study um, of a concept that we are pursuing uh, in terms of the electrical uh, DC distribution and collection, collection system for offshore tying it with HVDC transmission, right? Uh, I'll, I'll actually, uh, you know, go through this with a little bit more of the background and then 
talk uh, uh, what we did in course of the study and some conclusions that we, you know, we, we came um, and what we think are the next steps to move it forward. Um, I'll, I'll just skip this. This is just a, you know, a basic project overview of what we're doing, but let's get to the actual um, architecture. So if you look at today, uh, and, and I, I know that many of you are deep down into all this electrical system architecture, so this is not going to be anything new, uh, but for everyone else, just to set the stage, uh, the way power is transmitted from offshore wind goes through several layers of collection, distribution, voltage step up, you know, step down, et cetera, right? So if you take the most traditional way, um, you have turbines, which are outputting either 50 hertz or 60 hertz AC. Uh, it comes out of the turbine at typically 33 kV. It could be 66 kV. And then all these cables come to a collection platform, right? And in the platform, which is, which is basically the, um, you know, where, where you combine the cables, you have uh, protection for the individual feeders. Uh, then it goes to uh, a transformer, which could be on the same platform, could be on another platform. Um, and then you step up the voltage and then transmit it on shore. And then you have a substation again to, to, to basically step it down and so on. Uh, there are, when you, when you do this AC, transmission, um, these long high voltage AC cables, uh, they need some compensation because they, they draw quite a bit of reactive power. They're capacitive in nature, right? Um, and, and that results in, um, you know, the voltage going up on both ends of the cable. Um, so you have to bring them down with some reactive compensation. Um, uh, you also need to charge the cable. So there are, there are several layers of, um, you know, complexities associated with these high voltage cables when it comes to transmission, right? And as you increase the length and size of the power of the, of the cables and the amount of power that you're transmitting, the amount of compensation that you put in also increases. So it so happens, and this is all very, you know, even you can write down the equations and, and see that beyond a certain distance, if you try to transmit a certain amount of power through AC, it will not work because most of the power is actually absorbed or getting used to, to supply essentially the reactive power that's needed by the cable itself. You don't have capacity of the cable to transmit power. And you can mitigate that by just putting more and more compensation, but beyond a certain point, it becomes way too expensive. If you look at the wind farms that we have in the East Coast today, that's not the case because most of these are relatively you know, close to the shore. The amount of powers that we are transmitting is not that huge. So AC transmission perfectly works. There is not much point or case right today to go to DC transmission. But as these wind farms grow bigger, you know, the point of interconnects go more inland, the, the length of those cables, in other words, increases, AC transmission becomes more and more expensive and more and more in, in lack of, uh, you know, better word, clumsy. Uh, what happens in DC, and this has been, you know, if you look at the projects that have gone in, in, in Europe, in the North Sea, there are several uh, of those DC offshore projects connecting the uh, offshore wind has, has already been commissioned, they are running. It's not because they're like DC. It's because DC was cheaper to do than AC. The, the length of those cables in most of those projects were more than 100 miles, right? Uh, and what you do there is that you come to a collection platform and then you obviously have to go from um, AC to DC. So you have a converter station and the converter station is, it's, <coughs> it's typically what we call as the voltage source converters. Um, it's the power electronic devices that take high voltage AC and convert them to high voltage DC and obviously controllable, right? And then you regulate the DC voltage that's transmitted over the cable, and then you go back to the onshore side, and then you do the, basically flip it back to AC, uh, step it up or step it down, depending on, typically you would step it up again for, for transmission. 
Uh, on, on the DC, typically you have an AC platform where you actually collect the cables, the AC cables, and then um, you have a transformer to step it up, and then you go to a DC platform where um, you, you have the, of the converter, right? So that's the picture of the Dolwyn 3 platform. Um, what's happening today is that they're trying to combine those in, in, in one platform, right? Uh, platforms, offshore platforms, um, obviously most of you know, very, very expensive. So if you can reduce actually the footprint offshore, right? Uh, reduce the size of the platform, that has got a huge play in terms of reducing the overall cost of these projects, right? So what we have been, uh, so this is just two examples which G actually deployed. Um, the first one uh, that's commissioned in 2018, it's the Dolwyn 3. Um, again, if you look at the total distance, it's an 80 kilometer subsea cable, 80 kilometer um, cable, uh, underground cable on land, so total of uh, 160 kilometers, that's about 100 miles, right? And if you, if you actually go by, just do the analytical calculations, you will find that, you know, somewhere between 80 miles to 100 miles, you will find the crossover point depending on, you know, the size and voltage and so on for, you know, going from AC to DC. Um, and the typical voltage today for all this DC transmission is 320 kV. So it could be plus minus 320 kV, it could be a, a two symmetric monopoles or a bipole. Most of the projects are two symmetric monopoles. And then the one that is going on now, it's uh, to be commissioned in a couple of years. Um, uh, it's a SOFIA project, it's in UK. Um, uh, it's much, it's slightly higher power. Uh, you know, 1.3 gigawatt. But that's kind of the scale that you would see for most of these projects. So you go above a gigawatt, distance-wise you go 100 miles or, or slightly more than that, and that's where DC becomes um, uh, actually uh, cost-effective or uh, cheaper than going with AC. Now, <clears throat> what we have been looking at is that if you look at actually the way power is converted, right, so the, the wind generators, um, if you take most of these machines, Heliodex or the Vestas 14 megawatt machine, these are typically all permanent magnet generators, right? They are rotating at very low speed, typically without gearbox, and, um, and so their output is a variable voltage with variable frequency. So you cannot put it up to the grid, right, even if the grid is there. So you first rectify it, right? So you convert it to DC, and then you convert it back to uh, AC, right? So typically, most of the turbine manufacturers in North America, by default, their, their turbine would output 60 hertz. Right? So they would convert it back to 60 hertz, or put a transformer on top of the turbine, and the transformer would step up that voltage typically from 6 kV to 33 kV, right? And that forms essentially the, the collector system offshore, right? And then it goes to these platforms where the 33 kV or 66 kV is stepped up to 200 kV AC, still 60 hertz or 50 hertz. Then you rectify, right? Then you go to 320 kV with these large converter stations, and then you have this high voltage cable. If you just count the number of times you are converting back from AC to DC to AC and all that step, right? The question is, the frequency on offshore, who says it's got to be 50 hertz or 60 hertz? It has got nothing to do with the frequency of the grid because you have that DC link in between, right? So you can change the frequency to anything Right? The reason you do 50 hertz, 60 hertz today because you have 50 hertz, 60 hertz equipment and typically that's how you know, onshore wind is done. That's how those equipment came through, right? So you could actually bring down that frequency to zero and make it DC. So you could come out DC directly from the turbine itself. It has to be at medium voltage, form a DC collector and then step up the DC and then, um, and then basically you know, nothing is unchanged as far as your high voltage DC cable is concerned and your onshore substation is concerned. And so what's the benefit of doing this? That first of all, 
you know, you can, if you do it right, you can get rid of any of those AC equipment uh, on your offshore substation. Um, the, the AC transformers, switch gear, et cetera, and that saves space. Your platform should be much simpler, smaller, and effectively, it should be more uh, you know, cost effective. It's actually not too much of a stretch to come out at medium voltage DC from the turbine itself. Um, in fact, within, um, within G power conversion um, for uh, earlier project 15 years back, we had actually done that. And uh, it, it, it doesn't change a whole lot within, within the turbine. Um, it doesn't impact the generator. It, it's, it's really a add-on to the power converter by changing the transformer and adding a rectifier at the output. So it's doable, right? So the project that we had was to really look at this architecture. Um, and there were two parts. One was really just the system study, the power system study. You look at the architecture, um, and I'm not going to go through these tasks, but basically something like this, that you put all this together in, in a simulation uh, platform and look at you know, how the system operates and we benchmarked it. So it's not good to just start with, with what you are proposing, right? You first start with the baseline. So we basically created a whole bunch of models starting with um, what today's AC systems would look like. And if you are built a gigawatt farm with uh, 80 miles long cable, then how would that system actually look like? How did that perform? What's the reactive compensation needed, et cetera, et cetera, right? So that, that was benchmarked. And you'd find that even if you run those simulations with the data of the cables, um, you could very well see that most of the projects that were done and in that uh, you know, power voltage uh, category, uh, you get to very similar kind of results. Then we took it to uh, a standard HVDC system. And again, built PSCAD models. Um, we have... Uh, quite a bit of fidelity in those models in terms of how those HVDC converters operate. Um, and then we said that, okay, can you take now these HVDC converters and conf configure them as DC-DC converters? Um, and, and, and then we built the models and, and ran them, right? Um, basically, that was the first part of the study, that you know, if you just look at the system, power systems uh, uh, aspect of it. And the second part of the study was really to look at what what type of topologies for that DC-DC converter um, would actually be most cost effective. Um, DC-DC high voltage converters are not a commodity today. So the first pass that we took was that, hey, you have this standardized MMC building blocks. For those who are in this field, MMC is, <coughs> is basically the, the converter topology that's used for HVDC today. Uh, these are formed with um, basic building blocks um, uh, that, are, uh, that are basically DC to AC, so your you know, HVDC, standard HVDC of AC on one side and DC on the other side, and you connect them together in series to get to the high voltage. Um, and can you use the same blocks and run them in DC-DC? It is, it is definitely possible, uh, but there is more of a penalty if you try to do that in terms of, of size and cost. You would actually need more of those submodules to process the same amount of power. Um, so we, we actually came, uh, proposed uh, a different um, converter topology, uh, which is a switched capacitor topology. Many of you who have, um, um, who have worked with high voltage um, engineering, you know, so switched capacitor is kind of interesting. So what you do is that, and this is very basic, right? If you take a bunch of capacitors, you charge them in parallel, right? and then you discharge them in series. So you have to have some claptrap of switches which enable them to charge in series, uh, in parallel, and then you connect them in series and discharge them on the load. So that's how switch capacitor topologies operate. And believe me or not, many of your even cell phone chargers actually use the same circuit, but with you know, small you know, FETs and so on, right? But this can actually be done at, at a much higher voltage and higher power level and, um, and um, uh, it's, it's a much more elegant way of doing it in terms of you know, reducing the size and obviously there are com complexities of controls and so on. So that's the topology that we studied and how it can be adapted for this, uh, uh, for this configuration. 
Um, obviously, all this, it's a study, it's low TRL. Um, in order to actually deploy it, you know, there is uh, you know, obviously a lot of work. To be, you, you need to get to the next stage of, um, you know, doing some small scale demonstration and then, you know, having some pilot projects and so on. So there is there's long ways to go with, with a concept like this. But eventually what we tried to do was that put this together in um, some form of a techno-economical tool so that we can get uh, assessment of um, what does it, why does it matter, right? We can come up with something new or something very innovative, but it doesn't matter unless and until we're impacting, you know, the key metrics like an LCOE. And again, you, you have to look at the LCOE in, when you're comparing apples to apples. So we varied a few parameters and, and, and so wh wh what's kind of the sweet spot in terms of making this technology or where would this technology actually play? So you have to obviously go beyond a certain distance where DC would make sense. Um, and then once you go to that distance, you have to play with the collector voltage. And if you, if you actually increase the collector voltage, you will see that the LCOE is actually getting better and better compared to a standard uh, HVDC configuration. One thing that we <coughs> is difficult to assess at this point is that how much power density we have improved through the process because that actually plays a major role in reducing the size of the platform it, and it has got a you know much bigger cost impact of the overall system. So most of the HPDC vendors today, you know, one thing that they are trying to do is that how do you increase power density so that you know the platform that was having if you if you take that Dolwyn 3 platform, uh, the Sophia platform, which is 1.3 gigawatt, is marginally bigger. It is not proportionally bigger, right? So that makes a huge cost difference in the overall system. So now, if you can do this, uh, you know, switch capacitor without any transformers, um, it's just a solid state device in a much more compact footprint, it has got actually a much bigger uh, advantage. So I'll, I'll leave it up to that because I know there are a bunch of speakers and we can pick it up uh, for questions. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Rajiv. Uh, next up, uh, please help me welcome Travis Duville, uh, Project Manager, Pacific Northwest National Laboratory, and he is going to present his project, Maximizing Electrical System Benefits of Offshore Wind Energy in Southern Oregon and Northern California. So you made it all the way to the last hour, <clears throat> and we have a West Coast project for you. So, hey, you know, this actually, I, I, I bring that up because, and I'm, I only kid, but it's because uh, now RDC has shown incredible vision, I think, in awarding a West Coast project uh, back when they did. This was awarded uh, more than a year ago. Uh, we're about 10 months, 11 months into this project. Uh, and then also, I, I would say yesterday, I took, what I took away from the intro was 20% of the funding has gone towards grid work, which is also, I think, pretty visionary. So. Uh, thanks to my panelists as well. It's an honor to be up here with you, and thanks, Maget, for the introduction. So just quickly about our laboratory. Um, you know, I've kind of made this map to show you roughly where we're based. So we are the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory uh, with fundamental emphasis on uh, scientific discovery, power grid operations, and national security. Those are kind of our three major thrusts. And we have most of our facilities are in the Pacific Northwest. We have some joint institutes. Uh, a joint global change research institute with the uh, University of Maryland and then another institute with uh, Oregon State University and we have a, a DC office. I actually hail from the Portland office. Many of our, peop our people on this project are in the, in the Seattle office and then I'll call out SQUIM as well. The SQUIM facility is a marine coastal, marine coastal research laboratory and uh, a lot of good work happens there and, and, and more offshore wind research work, uh, hopefully grid work can happen there as well in terms of hardware testing. Um, just in terms of our, our approach to, to wind energy research, we have these six, <clears throat> five major domains, uh, and you can see they're, they're listed on, I'll let you read this in the slide, but wind, wind resource characterization is a, is a huge focus for us. Environmental monitoring, obviously wind systems integration, that's what I'm speaking about today. Data stewardship, and we have a distributed wind program run by Alice. So quickly, you know, the project, this, this pitch will be mostly on motivation and and an approach and some early results uh, just to 
give you a heads up. Um, the motivation for this project came from two primary places. The first was we ran a study in 2020, which indicated when we scanned, uh, compared offshore wind in Oregon with other land-based wind energy facilities, we kind of stumbled across this, you know, much, uh, you know, there was this hypothesis that offshore wind is, is so much more consistent and, and calmer, and it seemed a little bit like a hot take. We wanted to investigate that a little bit better. And so we ran these, these statistical uh, surveys of, of the, the ramp rates that we see, and, and if you look at the lower two histograms between, in blue, uh, a Southern Oregon offshore wind facility, and then uh, an Oregon Gorge, or Columbia River Gorge facility, which has a pretty similar um, uh, energy volatility, or kind of a rampiness um, uh, histogram, but, and then compared that with a very energetic uh, location in Wyoming, which Pacific Corps develops wind parks in Wyoming, and, and wheels the power to the northwest. So we see a, a significant difference in terms of the, the amount of reserves that would be required to balance that resource. And then that kind of triggered the thought of, you know, could we investigate from a planning perspective the impacts, the incurred and avoided impacts on reserves to serve load reliably uh, when we have a chance to kind of curate uh, this renewable energy generation portfolio uh, that we're building now. And the, the other piece of the motivation was, of course, that we have incredible IEC class one wind speeds between Coos Bay and or Oregon and, and Eureka, California. So here's the project, um, kind of the one slider on the project. You can kind of see the focus uh, domain in the, out to the, <clears throat> from the state federal water boundary out to the 1300 meter bathymetry contour in the, in the inset image here. And it's running 18 months. Uh, we're looking to optimize generation footprints and evaluate three conceptual generation plus transmission plus representation of the WEC. Um, combinations through this valuation methodology, which, which is kind of indicated in this lower right uh, value wheel. So I won't talk a lot about the valuation methodology today, but we do have, that's one of the key deliverables of this, of this work, and it is drafted now, and we, and we are seeking to implement it shortly. I'll also add that we have, the work has been extended by BOEM, and BOEM funded our original uh, Oregon grid impact, grid, grid value study in 2020. Um, and they, they helped us investigate, and they are helping us investigate power flows all the way into the San Francisco Bay Area, which is the largest load center in the vicinity of this world-class resource. So here's the project team. We've got a great group of folks at the laboratory, and we're doing system scale, uh, developing the system scale valuation methodology. We're also, we have run a generation optimization. I'll show you the results of that in a moment here. Uh, we look to do some capacity expansion and dispatch modeling. And um, that's primarily through um, a, a production cost model that dispatch mo modeling, so think economic uh, dispatch, security constrained dispatch, but then also some power flow work of HVAC and HVDC networks. And to help us with some of that work, we have Hitachi as a partner uh, who is helping us primarily on the production cost modeling side. And I believe Jin is on the, on the line watching today, so we really appreciate his support. Also, we, we work with the Pacific Ocean Energy Trust, which is an entity that has broad reach in the, in the, with the Pacific offshore wind um, opportunity, and they, they've helped us bring in some key advisors, and, um, including at the utility level. So they've been very helpful. Also in informing, you know, through their industry reach, you know, details on the balance of plant side, for example, um, uh, for potential points of interconnection that industry is considering, uh, and potential topologies for interconnection. So here are the three, what we're calling scenarios. I know in different studies that term carries different connotation, but we have these three, as I said, combination of generation, transmission, and then representation of the, the Western interconnection. So in the first scenario, we're, the base case is the ADS 2030, so kind of a near-term representation of the, of the West, uh, the Western interconnection, 3.4 gigawatts of, of nameplate capacity of offshore wind in Southern Oregon primarily, and then radial HVAC uh, inner ties, 230 kV, Energized, similar uh, to some of the AC um, uh, numbers you saw from Rajiv's presentation preceding this one. And then in scenario two and three, we have a more aggressively decarbonized Western uh, interconnection, and we put in quite a bit more uh, offshore wind, and, and we look at POIs that span southern Washington all the way through mostly southern Oregon, but also we look inland. So I would say they span Oregon and then into Northern California. And we, we consider the, the difference between the two scenarios is a radial HVDC versus some sort of networked HVAC, HVDC concept. <clears throat> and we're midway, so we're, we're still defining those. But um, I can tell you where we are headed so far. So here, here's scenario one. Um, 
We're, we're looking primarily at the Coos Bay call area. So if people aren't familiar, the call areas in the ocean here on this image are outlined in black. Um, and we'll go from north to south. That's the Coos Bay call area, the large one. Then south of that is the Brookings call area. And then the very south is the Humboldt, um, now lease area. Um, and it's, the auction is happening as we speak right now. So some of you might be checking your phone like I am. Um, <clears throat> but you'll also notice that I didn't model any, any offshore wind coming out of that Humboldt wind energy area in this first scenario. And that's because the transmission is fairly limited there. And I would argue that the auction results um, underscore that if you look at the difference between Humboldt and Morro Bay calls. Um, but anyways, what we're seeking to do here is it's just, we're not, we're not we're, this was a sensitivity that we wanted to take into account. We're, we're going to only draw the generation from the centroid of these call areas. And it's fairly simple, AC, radial interconnections. We don't want to show a, what we might think is a better part of the call area versus another. There was some sensitivity around that. So uh, we're just going from the centroids. We're primarily pulling power out of the Coos Bay call because transmission's better. And some of this is a bit of a judgment call. We do identify seven um, specific uh, onshore upgrades. So this is informed by contingency work, power flow work, um, seven specific onshore upgrades which are required to integrate this much power uh, in Southern Oregon. And then some quick results from the production cost model so far. These are very preliminary, but you can see that as expected when you put two, well, 2.7 gigawatts of power flows into Southern Oregon, you see a reduction in, in uh, the, the amount of power um, that comes across the Cascades from Southwest Washington into the Portland area, into, the, into basically the I-5 corridor as we, as we speak of it, the Willamette Valley. Um, and that happens across all hours and all months. <clears throat> and then we track, a big part of this project is to track the interregional impacts. So we look at the Pacific DC intertie and, the, and also the California Oregon intertie. And we see you know, that some of that power does go, and this is a bit of a difference from work that we've seen in the past, just because the, the offshore wind integration is a higher amount now. So uh, we see larger amounts of flows that are going <clears throat> across that, um, that intertie, past 65, for example. Um, across all, virtually all months. Um, south end of California is positive in these plots. So these are the kind of things we're tracking through the production cost model. There are other interregional flow gates that are of interest, which we continue to, to scrutinize. Um, and then we, we've defined a few resilience cases because we think there's an opportunity here from a transmission perspective to enhance reliability of, um, of, of transmission networks in the West. And that's a lot, a lot of the interregional play. Uh, that's available here. So what we've done is we've basically come up with a scaling methodology to capture what has become a, an annual occurrence, the, a, the heat wave, the, the, southern, the southern Oregon, kind of northern California, but even broader southwestern heat wave has become kind of a regular thing, and it's, and it's an important dynamic to consider um, in the West. And so this is a, this is a, this is a demand side uh, scaling. <clears throat> And then we, we consider how well offshore wind will, will serve that increase in demand on specific days. And in particular, there's a second case that we design here, and it's a, basically an extension of that first one. It's all motivated by something that happened in July 2021, where there was this intense heat wave. And there was, at the same time, a wildfire. <clears throat> and the wildfire tripped the intertie. It tripped the, the COE, the California Oregon AC intertie that I just showed you. And because of a stability need, the, the DC intertie had to be also reduced significantly. So California lost, which is highly dependent on energy imports from the Northwest and also the Southwest, lost 5,500 5, megawatts of imports. So I'm just showing you how we're framing these resilience cases. We don't have the results yet to share with you. <clears throat> the last piece is this generation footprint. And I didn't, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna spare you the details of, of how we got here, but we basically formed a, a mixed linear, linear linear programming problem and, and defined some constraints fed through production cost modeling, what, how, what amount of power could be delivered to the buses that are indicated on this, kind of this, this arc map screenshot I have on here. So Moss Landing, Martin in San Francisco, San Mateo in San Francisco, Potrero in San Francisco. There also, there's also the Tesla uh, substation um, in uh, kind of inland from San Francisco, uh, Sacramento area. And then we've got <clears throat> Trojan and Alston, which are buses in, in Portland, and then Satsop, which is a kind of a Grays Harbor uh, so pretty farther, far north from this shape. And we find this shape is the, is the best combination of energy and capacity value based on 20 years of, of wind speed data at hub height put through a power curve. And we've, we've, we've gone as far as drawing out um, the wind plant uh, footprints and, and defining centroids and, and starting to design transmission that comes off these for scenario two and three. 
So next steps, out of time. Next steps um, <clears throat> are to design the transmission infrastructure specifically that's going to support the delivery of, of that power and then to run the power flow and, and the, the full production cost modeling of these all three scenarios. We've really done mostly one for now. <clears throat> and then finally is to put those through that valuation methodology which I spoke of. So I look forward to telling you more about that when we, when we get there and taking your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Travis. Next up, uh, Eric Hines, uh, Director of Showing Graduate Program at Tufts University, who is going to present his project on transmission expansion planning models for offshore wind energy. Please help me welcome Eric. Welcome again. <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, thank you to my panel. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here presenting with you all. Thank you, my God, for hosting and to now RDC and for the support of this project. This is a collaboration between uh, Tufts University, Iowa State University, and Clemson University. And I want to give credit to my colleagues. Uh, my key collaborators at uh, Tufts University are Barbara Cates Garnick, uh, who's in the Fletcher School former Undersecretary of Energy for Massachusetts. She runs our policy division and our thinking about policy on the project. James McCalley from Iowa State University is our lead uh, power systems analyst and transmission expansion, expansion planning expert. Johan Enslin at Clemson University runs our uh, work on technology. And so through this project, we've attempted to create a workshop where we're talking consistently about power systems planning, expansion planning, HVDC, multi-terminal technology, and policy at the same time. The role that I play on the project is the perspective of infrastructure and the construction of large-scale projects and thinking long-term about these things. I also want to acknowledge uh, several of our collaborators and furthermore, Per Anders Luf from National Grid is a colleague of ours at Tufts University who's currently teaching power systems with us. So we've been excited to pull this team together. And I'm gonna show you uh, we're in the process of creating some pretty compelling tools. I think that uh, we're through about year one in the project. Uh, we'll be done by next September, right around the same time as the Atlantic Offshore Wind Transmission Study. And I'm thinking that sometime in mid-spring, our tools are going to be up and running and ready. And so right now, we're sort of in this place where we're doing a lot of stuff with CEII data. Uh, and we can't necessarily share some of our early results. But once the tools and the reduced models are done, a lot of this is going to be able to be more public. So why am I starting with this? Um, this spring, I developed a hobby of checking electricity prices. On January 15th of this year, uh, New England prices are about $200 a megawatt hour. They're supposed to be about 40, uh, somewhere around there. So the prices were uh, fluctuating wildly. February 11th, they went down to $0 a megawatt hour. They went negative at different times this spring. And then a couple days later on February 14th, they went up to $300 a megawatt hour. And so if anybody thinks that offshore wind is expensive, they need to review these prices uh, that we've had. And you can see this is about the $50 a megawatt hour. Around there, January, February, we were hovering three-day rolling average, $150 a megawatt hour for prices. And obviously, you can see the spikes. You can also see in the histogram the... Uh, the mean price was $92.35 a megawatt hour, literally just a few cents above what we calculated as the average offshore wind price for nine projects between uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, New York, and other states. So we think that the market is already in this moment of transition. We think that things are very serious from a price point of view. And we also are looking at the United States and comparing it to Europe. When I created this map originally, I was like, oh my God, the North Sea is so big. You know, sort of coming from the East Coast, I hadn't really thought of it that way. But you look at how big it is, how much shallow water there is, what an existing oil and gas industry there is, and what a natural electrical network topology there is in that area of the world where you come to the United States and we do have this wonderful outer continental shelf. We have this wonderful offshore wind resource. We have other things that are distinctive, but we're essentially, we have a very different topology. And so we're just plugging in along this line. And so the idea of a transmission backbone really makes sense. Uh, in my experience so far among the experts, there's a consensus that this is what we're going to need to do a serious offshore wind build out. 
And I'm going to go back in time a little bit before this project and sort of tell you how our team formed and how we came together. We started by responding to requests for public comment from the state of Massachusetts. In the 2016 original legislation, there was an enabling legislation to study independent print transmission procurement. By about 2018, this had gotten more serious, and by 2020, the state of Massachusetts was requesting public comment. Now, here's the catch. Remember 2016, 1,600 megawatts was a lot of power. By 2020, that was a relatively small number. And so all of the public comment period in spring of 2020 was framed around 1,600 megawatts. And the conclusion that spring was, well, we can do that on one project. Why do we need an independent transmission procurement? And so we spent most of our time, and I would say these were the young people in our, you know, in our team, were like, well, we need to do the 12,000 megawatts for the entire Mass Rhode Island wind energy areas. That's what we need to do. And so we started to produce these drawings of, you know, on the one hand, the spaghetti and the water, and on the other hand, what would a network look like? And, and sort of how do we start to visualize this? And we also noticed that we weren't, we as a community weren't visualizing this enough in order to be able to talk about differences and contrasts. And the black and green dots is we were trying to come up with a publicly available reduced model that we could use for these analyses. So we continued this work. And again, you know, and, uh, one of the things we like to do is we like to work with our public sector decision makers and specifically briefing folks in the public sector in Massachusetts. And right around the end of 2020, 2021, we produced this map and we said, do you guys really, have you seen this? Like this, these are not the Mass Rhode Island wind energy areas. These are everybody's wind energy areas. And New York's got a gigantic straw that it's sticking into these things. And these things are gonna be full up and they're all going to be spoken for a lot faster than anybody ever thought a couple of years ago. And so again, you know, one of the interesting things about this um, industry is that we're living in a historic moment and really literally moment by moment, we have to keep updating our figures. And so we did another generation of, clearly we weren't looking at uh, environmental pathways. This is just a topological you know, connection here, but we started to explore, okay, what happens? We plug it into the grid. What happens? We plug New York into the grid. Again, we were experimenting with open access models. By the time we got to this model, things started to get a little dicey. And then I had a student plug these two together and we blew up the whole model. And so we sort of, we kind of gave up at that point. We had gone through about five or six different open access models and decided that we needed to go to the full 90,000 bus Eastern Interconnect model, which is the one that we use now, and to create our own reduced model. And that's what we're in the middle of, is trying to figure out how to create a reduced model. So just to step back for a second here, U.S. electricity energy consumption. This is my energy transition in a, nut, in a nutshell, okay? We have uh, 4,000 terawatt hours a year that we consume right now, you know, 3,700 or so, but I round up to 4,000. Let's say we double it or triple it by 2050, 8,000 to 12,000 terawatt hours a year. This means that the grid needs to double to triple in size, okay? And so we're talking about massive, massive infrastructure investments and even though right now we're trying to get the early projects off the ground, we're trying to get to 30 gigawatts by 2030, we really need to be getting to 300 gigawatts by 2050 of offshore wind, which is just a tenth of the 3,000 gigawatts that we need to get to to transition the entire country. So as Walt Musial and I were talking, you know, he was saying, somebody had said to him recently, you can't go fast enough, you know, you can't go... Um, you can't go fast enough in the energy transition right now. And so we're sort of in the, and I think a lot of people in this room understand that. We also think there needs to be about a thousand gigawatts of green hydrogen used as storage and alternative fuels by that point. Now around the same time, uh, I would say in the last decade or so, through the SEAM study, and my colleague Jim McCallie was very, uh, worked closely on the SEAM study with NREL, the concept of a macro grid uh, has really been explored and vetted because how are we going to share <coughs> weather-based energy resources across time zones uh, over our massive country. And so we need super highways, three of them running east-west, three of them running north-south. Of course, I love this map because when they tried to get to the northeast the first time, they just gave up, okay? And you can't do that here. And we know that uh, in this part of the world and trying to get Hydro-Quebec to come down to Massachusetts. The second time they did it, they put it all offshore. And so there it is, there's the offshore wind backbone. And what I've been realizing and what I uh, have been thinking is that as the DOI is considering already 100 plus gigawatts of offshore wind, already more than the DOE target, okay, uh, we have in terms of lease areas and call areas, if we start to think about this, 
Could this offshore wind backbone be the first macro grid corridor? Because we have this thriving industry, we have a need to bring the uh, supply chain under control, get the costs down. We need to build this out for reliability. And the key to recognize in this map is we are all beach communities. We start in Cape Cod, we go to Long Island, we go to the Jersey Shore, we have the Delmarva Peninsula, we have the Outer Banks. There just aren't that many places to connect on the East Coast. So if I, if I try to connect 300 times at, let's say, one gigawatt each, this thing is going to be a mess, and the communities are going to get fed up with what's going on, and the developers aren't going to be able to negotiate these connections anymore. The only way we can see uh, doing this, and I'm not talking about the first tranche of projects. I'm not talking about the next five years. I'm talking about 2030 and beyond. We've got to start to figure out how to have landing points that can connect 10, 20, up to 30 gigawatts in a landing and then figure out how to get this into the grid, which is precisely what the macro grid was designed to be. So in this sort of strange inversion that the macro grid was always about bringing Midwestern wind out to New York and Massachusetts and to the coastline, now because of what's going on in our industry, it makes one wonder, might the first leg of the macro grid actually de facto be constructed off, the, um, off our Atlantic coast? And so here's where we are right now in terms of our studies, and this is the work that Jim McCalley is doing. And we're looking at POIs, uh, and we're searching, uh, we're looking at POI costs and about uh, system reinforcement costs and about reach circuit costs. And we are trying to understand what's gonna happen if you have lead lines versus if you have a backbone. And so there are times when we honor the existing plans of all the current uh, COPs and developments, and then there are times where we start from scratch just because we're trying to understand the grid and how it uh, conducts power flow so that we can understand where the power wants to go in certain cases. And so we also have, uh, you can see the dash lines are the reach circuits, that's how much it costs to get from shoreline, from landing to the POI, and then the various uh, connections between the POIs and the buses need to be reinforced and we're conducting system analyses of this. At the same time, my colleague Johan Enslin is developing proposals for a 30 gigawatt um, multi-terminal DC design. This is what this is here. We're coordinating with NREL in the AOWT uh, C study, AOWT study, uh, in terms of thinking about 85 gigawatts. Our next number was going to be 60, but 85 really kind of being the East Coast target that's been settled on. And then after that, we want to go to 100 plus. And 100 plus for us means at least 100, but perhaps 200, maybe 300, to start to see what do these things look like at scale. And so that's what we expect to be doing later in this year. Those analyses are all being done on the 90,000 bus TARA model and with optimization and, and, um, and stability analyses. Uh, after the fact, and then these, uh, this is a model that we're developing somewhere between, we wanted a 300 bus model, but then we went up to an 1800 bus model in order to get better fidelity. Now we're down to a 900 bus model and constructing a model where we actually get fidelity within about 40 megawatts on a given line at the lines that we care about near the coast is really what we're, what we're doing. So the, there's a real art to developing these models and I'm a big admirer of what the team has been doing here. And we're hoping that again, that this model will be the way that we can conduct uh, capacity expansion planning. And so you can see on the left, the, the Tara analysis that we're doing and all of this initial work in the 90,000 bus model kind of gives us a feeling for the behavior of the grid. Uh, what we want to run next is the coordinated expansion planning models. We want the model to be as small as possible so that we can iterate as many times as possible, but we want it to be big enough to be, again, on average within about plus minus 40 megawatts on any given line uh, to, compared to the Eastern Interconnect model. And then we're going to run our capacity expansion planning models based on that co-optimized expansion planning analysis, and then we're going to go back to the Tara model. And so we're trying to round trip between these two models, and we're trying to figure out what's the appropriate kind of tools. And then we're also trying to figure out what are the appropriate visualizations, because the people who need to see this information, ask questions, and iterate are not people who do power systems for a living. And so there's, there's this really a whole community approach to thinking about how do we talk about these problems. So thank you very much. Thank you, Eric. And um, next up is Jeff Odiak, America's Director for Offshore Wind Consultants, OWC, who is going to present about the shared landfall and route infrastructure. Please help me welcome Jeff.
All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thanks to now already see my panelists, uh, colleagues, and everyone for staying until the last hour. Um, yeah, so I want to talk a little bit about our project, which has been going on for about uh, somewhere like six to eight months or so, and we're, we're in the middle of it. So uh, talk a bit about the problem. I mean, this is really basic. So, you know, we all want to build offshore wind farms. They all need export cables, so there's going to be a lot of export cables, right? Um, so here's an illustration of what our problem what the problem is that we're trying to solve. So here, I mean, this is just an illustration, right? We have four offshore wind farms on this map. Uh, they have, they're going to three different point, point of interconnection substations. They're, making, they're uh, going through four different landfall locations. The cables are crossing over each other. You see this little icon, which is like represents a city or something like that, right? That's quite common. Um, it's not very organized, right? You have wind farms going to different locations. They're not, it's not necessarily going to the most optimal locations, like going to the nearest location. The routing's not optimal. And that's just the way wind has been done uh, in many places like the UK and Asia uh, and the projects so far in the US that are ongoing. So, uh, so that causes some problems because it rewards first mover projects, um, projects that can get their landfall and, um, and their cable route before the others, and also POIs. Um, yeah, and so this map is a little bit out of date, and uh, actually Eric's maps set the scene pretty well, right? So the east coast of the U.S., it's built up, there's not a lot of POIs, there's not a lot of landfalls, there's not a lot of cable routes, um, and that's a problem not just the east coast, but, but anywhere really. So yeah, so what are the issues with landfall? Why does it need so much space, um, and what's the issue there? I mean. When we land cables at landfall, we, we, do, need, uh, we do need quite a lot of space. Um, it's usually a thermal problem, mostly, right? So we have electrical current going through the cable. It interacts with the resistance of the conductor. It produces heat. Um, and the cable has a limiting factor on how, on the, the temperature it can operate at, OK? Um, so these first mover projects, when they go in, they take the landfall. They use you know, as much space as they're allowed. They don't really leave a lot left for, for the next projects that are coming along. So that landfall is sort of done and used, and that's it. Uh, so how are we trying to solve that? So here's the same picture that we had on the, on the left here that I just talked about a minute ago. And the one on the right, um, same four projects, but now they're connecting in through what I would call like a shared landfall or shared uh, cable corridor. So that's that green blob on the map, OK? So the idea is, can we develop like a, uh, a central piece of infrastructure that can allow multiple projects to connect in um, and maximize the use of any landfall or cable corridor. So our project is to develop the concept design for such an infrastructure, um, and it's basically a feasibility study. So evaluate the feasibility, do an initial cost uh, estimate for it, do a cost benefit analysis, think about some of the, do a qualitative assessment, think, think about things like, um, uh, development uh, frameworks, permitting, uh, regulatory issues, this kind of thing. Uh, so project team. So I work for ODBC. Uh, we're the lead on the project. We're an engineering consultancy. Uh, we're primarily doing the project management and uh, the civil engineering. Uh, we're working with ITP Energize, another engineering consultancy. They're leading the cable rating uh, and cable modeling aspect. Uh, we're working with Power Advisory. They're a subject matter expert on, on regulatory issues. Uh, Continuum Associates is um, a small consultancy that did a little bit of work on POI selection. And Prospect Hill Consulting um, is, a, is a permitting, uh, they're permitting experts. So, so they're uh, evaluating uh, the permitting framework for this. And let's say, so yeah, we had a few phases of the project. We had a stakeholder engagement phase, a design basis stage. We've completed those. We're in the middle of concept design now. Uh, we'll be going into cost assessment, concept evaluation, and doing that qualitative uh, assessment once the concept design is done. And I'll show you the concept design here in a second. So uh, first, yeah, what have we done to date? So we've done the stakeholder engagement. So we reached out to, to a, a lot of developers to get their feedback on the project. We reached out to some of the uh, regulatory bodies and government bodies. Uh, I think generally the feedback has been good. Uh, everybody had a lot of ideas. Um, a lot of the same topics were raised, so I noted some of those here, like reliability, uh, security, uh, yeah, 
ownership and development models. Everybody was very interested in these topics. And we had some feedback that we took through to our basis of design. So I'll talk about the basis of design next. So yeah, so we decided to try to design the concept for to handle up to six offshore wind projects. Uh, we decided to assume that they're all connected with HVDC cables. Um, we noted yeah, the, the different areas we're going to investigate as part of the qualitative assessment. And as part of the proposal, we decided to, um, initial proposal, we decided to pick a reference location. So what's a reference location? That's an example location to design, the, to do the concept design around. Now, we want, you know, the overall concept to be universal. So you could, you know, use it in California, use it in New York, use it in Europe or wherever. But in order to assess something, you need to come up with something kind of tangible that's based on some sort of example, right? So uh, I'll take you through the uh, reference location in a second. Uh, and the last point was, uh, from the basis of design, we decided to look at offshore landfall and onshore. So that's a little bit different than what we had in the proposal. It was initially just called like landfall, shared landfall. Um, but once we looked at, picked the reference project, it, uh, we ended up expanding the scope, looking a little bit more at offshore and looking at, uh, at onshore in more detail as well. So I'll show you that in a sec. So, here is the reference location. So it's probably hard to see, but this map on the left is the Narrows. So that's a New York Harbor. Uh, the New York Bight projects are to the south of that map or, or to the bottom of that map. Um, we see Brooklyn there. And if you go up to the, through the harbor, you're into Manhattan, right? So pretty much all the New York Bight projects have to connect into this, into this area. I mean, there's no POIs really on Long Island. Um, there are I imagine most of the projects are looking to connect into parts of Brooklyn or Manhattan. Um, so we need to get cables through this area. It's very constrained. Uh, this part here is called the Narrows. So there's the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Uh, there's a lot of shipping, uh, of vessel traffic through here. There's anchoring. There's probably old infrastructure in the water. It's going to be very difficult to install cables through here. So what we were thinking, and this orange line is the like proposed cable, example cable route uh, that we've come up with, is uh, yeah, designing this offshore infrastructure to get us through the Narrows and then make landfall into Brooklyn. And just as an example, I think we picked Gowanus as the POI. So this would go onshore and up to Gowanus, but we're not doing any like detailed cable routing onshore or anything like that as part of this, just, just the concept design. And yeah, so I'll show you some nice pictures here. So this is the offshore side. And so that, that orange line that was sort of hugging the coast of Brooklyn, our idea there was actually we, we would almost, we could um, redo the sea defense along Brooklyn in a way that will allow more, uh, uh, multiple cables to use that sea defense. And it also doubles in the sea defense is a little bit old and dilapidated and it actually needs probably renewal, especially with like climate change resiliency and all of that. So it might make sense to do something like that for these, to, to enable these uh, New York Bight projects. So this, uh, this picture on the left was the initial sort of drawing and you could see the, the bulkhead, which is like the, the sea defense wall on the right. Uh, and there's an existing revetment and then we're building it up with like gabion baskets and then some uh, chambers to put the cables in. And you could see that example only had three chambers. We were initially only designing for three cables and then the feedback was, well, you actually need to be more ambitious to design for more. So then we have the second iteration on the right, which is fairly similar, but now this has six cables with some spacing uh, between them, or six cable circuits, let's say, so six projects. Okay, so that's the offshore design. This is a 3D model of that offshore design, and we're still working through this. We need to do some uh, thermal analysis on it, but just to give you an illustration. Uh, this is the chamber design. So we were thinking actually the baskets could be removed and there would be these chambers here and give developers access to their cables directly. Uh, the chambers might, we might be able to do something with some ventilation through the top. We're thinking that they could be lockable. They might be pre-cast and uh, could be basically pre-assembled and brought to site and, and assembled on site and, and locked together. Uh, and that's what this groove connection is that's being referred to. Yeah, uh, this actually should say onshore. So this is the onshore uh, concept. So one of the feedback from the developers was, 
yeah, how can we get a lot of cables in the road? So uh, again, it's mostly a thermal problem. Uh, we thought about doing cable tunnels or something like that, but um, for the moment, we're thinking about how can we use traditional sort of duct banks, possibly the chamber design, and get them as close together and basically get um, the most gigawatts in like a single lane of road as possible, right? So a few design iterations here. I think I'll just skip over to, to the latest one. So this is what we've been working on very recently. Like this is from this week. So here we have um, five circuits that we sh shown that's about four and a half meters wide. Um, we were trying to do six. It was really difficult to do it. Uh, we think four and a half meters basically represents like one lane of road plus like a sidewalk. Uh, three meters would be basically be about one lane and that would fit about three uh, projects in the road. And this design here, actually, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, on the plan view at the bottom, we're thinking about like grates um, every 200 meters or so, and we're looking into like um, passive airflow between a cable circuit. So that provides some, what we're trying to achieve is a, a situation where there's thermal independence between the circuits, so there's not shared heating between one project's cables and the next. Um, that was some important bit of feedback we had from the developers. So that's the design so far. And yeah, so what's next? So we're still working through the concept design stuff. Uh, we have to do some computational fluid dynamic modeling to do the thermal analysis. And then we will be uh, doing the cost modeling and the qualitative uh, assessment. And that's when we'll be digging into things like the uh, development and ownership models in more detail. And yeah, so we hope to uh, touch on all these topics here once we, uh, once we get there. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Now, last but not least, um, we have Dr. Lee Zhou, um, professor at the Department of Naval, uh, Naval Architecture and Marine Engineering at the University of Michigan, who is going to present his project on robust stabilization of subsea power cables using nonlinear energy sinks. Please help me welcome Lee. So I'm I'm Lee Zhou. I am currently in University of Michigan. I moved there in August. Twenty years ago, I stayed in Boston for five years, finished uh, my two master degree in electrical engineering and mechanical engineering from MIT and a PhD from MIT. So very nice city, and I didn't get a chance to move back. <laughs> okay, and uh, so. Uh, after my PhD study, I worked in Chicago in a company for four years, and between that, between my PhD and master's, I worked in GE briefly in that time. Uh, in, um, in that is a program manager working on machine dynamics. So uh, after working company, I returned to university first uh, in Stony Brook. I created the lab, Energy Harvesting and Mechatronics Research Lab, then 2014, I moved to University of Virginia Tech, and I was the director of NSF Center for Energy Harvesting. So currently, my lab name is Marine uh, Renewable Innovation and Education Lab, Marine Lab, short, OK. So uh, my work in the past uh, training side work on mostly vibration dynamics control and uh, design, and uh, recently focus more and more on the more energy. So in this project, and we want to stabilize the dynamics subset cable and using one type of nonlinear tuned mass temper we call the nonlinear energy sink. Uh, the project is in collaboration with NX in UIUC and uh, Matt Ho in Unreal and uh, my former colleague Omar in Virginia Tech. Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, talk about technical challenges, talk about state arts, and uh, then present the proposal solution and the research plan. So as uh, uh, our, our speaker talked yesterday, Ross 
talk yesterday, and uh, for the offshore wind energy, there will be 7,000 miles of cable. That means 7,000 miles from Fairbanks to Boston, Boston to Miami, okay. So significant portion of the cable is uh, in the ocean floating, we call it dynamic cable, right? There's also static cable, as you can see here. So the dynamic cable, there's a huge vibration from different, uh, different resources. Uh, the platform itself in vibration, right? And the fluid also induces vibration, which is vortex induced vibration, okay? And how important is this cable? We cited a number from one company, G-Cube, this insurance company that insures 70 75% of offshore, offshore wind energy project. So in our report, it states the subsea cable failure accounts for 77% of the uh, offshore wind farm maintenance, okay, the cost loss. So, and because a big vibration, it creates a fatigue problem. So, uh, what we want to do is how to reduce the cable vibration. Okay, so that is the objective of the project. So, uh, take a look at the typical cable, right, it can be very large, uh, three to 12, some places said up to one foot, this is the meter. So it's complicated inside, and outside it put in the ocean. Ocean, there's a wave, there's a current, right, this platform vibration, and uh, the vortex induced vibration is important. And the vortex induced vibration, typically there's such kind of shape, there's a fixed frequency. That frequency is related with the uh, cable diameter D is related with velocity of the of fluid V, and you can write in that way um, as uh, Stroker number, okay, ST. So uh, in the in from the literature in the upper side of figure, you can find okay, and uh, usually such a number is about a point two in a large range of velocity range, real number, okay. So therefore, uh, if you calculate based on the uh, fluid of the ocean current or tidal current, uh, negative two meters to positive two meters, you will find this, this frequency is from zero to three hertz. So it's very, very large, depend on velocity, right? The tidal velocity change twice a day in Atlantic Ocean, once a day in Pacific Ocean. So you can say the frequency will change. So come back to the cable vibration, and uh, in literature there are many, many different ways to reduce the subsea cable vibration. Well, for example, the weak stabilizer, and uh, typically I amplified one figure, that's called a fairing, right? So this is fairing, they, they were stabilize this cable in, uh, instead of let it induce vortex, right? Another is weak splitter, and uh, is you have ribbon, you have hair attached to the cable, and it uh, breaks the cable, uh, breaks the uh, vortex-induced vibration, okay? So each, uh, each type of way to reduce the vibration, there are pros and cons. Uh, this figure compare a uh, different way to reduce the cable vibration. We considered the effectiveness of vibration suppression and, uh, and consider the drag, right? You have cable, you put it in the water, that's a drag. And you, we also compare how easy we can re repair that and retrofit or not, eventually cost, right? So, and none of the way uh, really, really achieved success so far. And uh, so, for example, if you took, take a look at a fairing exa example, and it can effectively reduce the vibration and uh, the drag is small, repair is easy. However, and uh, there's a galloping phenomenon. What, what it means, you have something outside like the yellow color, this fairing, okay. And however, it needs to be able to free rotate. And if it's not free rotate, the symmetry will disappear and then you introduce a galloping phenomenon. Galloping is, is when you induce a vibration. If you say overhead power line, sometimes it's very, very low frequency, very, very large amplitude, especially there's ice built on that, break the symmetry, this is a phenomenon, okay. Uh, mention over, over cable power line vibration. So 
and uh, there's uh, one picture we put on the top, okay? And you can see uh, people put there, this is a uh, tuned mass damper or vibration absorber. Here it is specifically called uh, stock bridge damper. The idea is you have one vibration body, and if you tune this uh, frequency to the close to the natural frequency of the cable, uh, the natural frequency of the cable and um, depend on the tension force. Right, so it's different from under un, undersea cable. Okay, oh, uh, power line cable. Uh, so there's one natural frequency depend on the tension. So <laughs> if you tune that frequency to the natural frequency of cable, and this tuned mass damper or vibration absorber can reduce the vibration. Okay, uh, so come back to the power line uh, difference of overhead power line and subsea cable. Okay, subsea cable usually the tension force is really, really small. It's different from the uh, overhead power line. And uh, the natural frequency really depend, uh, the vibration frequency depend on the vortex induced vibration. As I mentioned, it can change, it can be zero frequency, it can three hertz. So, uh, so for the same idea, if you implement it on the subsea cable, it will not work because the tuned mass damper or uh, stock bridge damper only work in one frequency. If you change 10%, the system will not work. So here we introduce the concept of nonlinear energy sink. A nonlinear energy sink and you compare the figure file, that two mass system and another two mass system looks very, very close. So the only thing is we use nonlinear stiffness here. Typically it's a cubic stiffness K2. And the left side figure, we compare the situation with, without in such kind of nonlinear energy sink. Nonlinear energy sink because this nonlinear stiffness, it has very, very broad bandwidth. So if the frequency change, it will definitely change the effect effectiveness. So this nonlinear and this sync, our collaborator and the NS Vacasis in UIUC is an expert in this topic. And uh, another collaborator Omar uh, working company for eight years. He designed a lot of over uh, overhead power lines, this type of vibration absorber. So now the team and we team up together to solve the under cable vibration. So, and uh, to achieve such kind of nonlinear stiffness and inside the ocean, we have to make sense easier to install, retrofitable, right? And uh, what we propose is this type of structure. So there's a steer look like similar as the overhead power line and there are two mass and we are tied to the power line. However, here we use a post barcode beam and uh, with the post barker beam, we will look like the uh, upper side of the figure. And uh, we, we post barker beam will achieve uh, idea and cubic stiffness in that region. In that way, it will be same as the nonlinear energy sink, the condition we need to achieve uh, third, third order nonlinear stiffness. This system we design there, we can clamp to the power cable and uh, you, you by diver or using underwater robot, right? And then we design some coupler mechanism here. And then by adjust the coupler, we adjust the tension, nonlinear stiffness tension. In that way we can achieve, we can do in situ adjustment. This is the idea, okay. So now uh, there's a risk and a significant risk you can see everything under the ocean, right? And the biophonin can grow up on that. And uh, the good thing is, this is nonlinear uh, tuned mass damper or nonlinear absorber, nonlinear energy sink. It's not sensitive to the mass change. Uh, what I mean, if you have biophonin grow up on the two mass, it's fine. And uh, we have cubic stiffness, right? So uh, as long as the cubic stiffness right is okay. And uh, so we also need to consider the non-stationary fluid speed and because the velocity is changing, that's, uh, uh, so, so there's uh, other challenges we need to uh, handle over all project process. That is what we propose the work scope. So, and so, so first uh, we have project kickoff meeting. Then we work together with Matt uh, Matt Hall in Unreal to 
create the baseline for subset cable, especially the vortex induced vibration mechanism and uh, the fatigue. Then we work together to design such kind of nonlinear energy sink and uh, conduct uh, dynamics analysis and uh, verify in the lab. We initially proposed a three years program and including go local meeting, including the field demonstration. And in this NRDC, the project is, and this contract is almost done. And we only focus on category A and one year study. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So at this time, I'm going to invite uh, all the panelists to join the stage. And for the audience, um, please uh, scan the, the QR code that's on the screen, or you can go to Slido and, and putting in this code to put in your questions. I saw that uh, there are a few questions that are coming in. Uh, but while you do that, if you haven't done it, um, I'll start with this. So Eric said earlier that with the uh, offshore wind goals, we can go fast enough. Uh, 30 by 30 is very ambitious, and 2030 is seven years <laughs> from now, <laughs> which is going to come quite fast, uh, let alone over 100 gigawatt by uh, 2050. So with that, and in terms of transmission, if you have to double it or tri triple it, we can keep doing uh, what we've been doing. Um, there is a lot of work to be done uh, on transmission and doing upgrades. So with that comes innovation, uh, creativity, and so on, and that's why we're all here. So my question to you all is that you individually tackle a piece of the problem and trying to solve the puzzle individually. So. Um, do you have any idea on how to coordinate all these solutions so that we are not working in silo and how to integrate it and um, facilitate the integration of offshore into the grid? Who wants to start? I'll, I'll start. I, I think one thing I was thankful for uh, when we got this project was that at the time, uh, Carrie Hitt made sure that uh, Travis and I met each other. Uh, he said, she said, you know, you guys are doing two sides of the country, you need to start talking. And, and then also, Jeff, I think there was a, uh, we had an introductory conversation as well. And, and then Rajiv, we wound up crossing paths. So I, I think the idea that, you know, the, the people doing this work are deliberately being introduced to each other and, and encouraged to talk is, um, I'm glad that's happening. I mean, and then I think you're right. There's a lot of being aware of each other's work. And we have to spend half of our time working and half of our time coordinating with each other. So. Yeah, and I might, may I'll just jump in. I fully agree with that. And I think it can't just be the researchers knowing each other, right? It has to be the states. It has to be, I think the states have a huge role to play. But the RTOs, right? Um, the, the industry, to some extent, of course. But I think, yeah, in terms of developing transmission, there are many different authorities and different parts of, the, of where transmission would be laid. Um, and then there's the whole, you know, environmental justice piece and making sure that we don't you know, for example, the maps I drew, which had nothing to do with exclusion zones or, you know, it was just, you know, straight lines between points. Can't do that. You know, we really have to get smarter than that. And, and these studies serve a purpose and they need to be framed against other, you know, other layers. If you think of like a GIS product, you know, we've got a transmission layer and here's a, you know, you know a, a community layer or maybe it's a dozen of those. But I do think that we have to, we have to kind of circulate these findings across the decision maker chain, if you will. It's not just the researchers. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, a forum like this is good, um, but I do think that uh, for these kind of, you know, projects, particularly we, we got to kind of, you know, uh, meet each other mostly because of the pandemic online when we were presenting, you know, last year or during the reviews. Uh, we listened to each other, but I don't think that we had the opportunity to actually get together and sort of have a workshop, right? Um, there are a lot of ideas that we can shuffle against each other, um, learn from each other, and that can actually uh, help to um, maybe even change directions of what, how we are thinking, right? Uh, because when NOWRDC is funding one 
you know, one area, right? There are individual projects that get awarded. Eventually, everyone does their stuff, does it good, and probably succeeds. But if you put them collectively, actually the success story can be much, much stronger and better. And I think as we go through the project, I would say that we should think about, can we, should we have actually, you know, maybe a couple of times a year, uh, it's not just presenting our stuff, but really a dialogue, a workshop that we can work together for a couple of days. Um, uh, I know that there will be IP and all that kind of stuff, but I think even, you know, within the, the, the cons construct of what can be shared and what not, um, there is a lot that we can do together, which, uh, um, which I think we can all benefit from. I fully, uh, I fully agree, and uh, I think this the watch, uh, this <coughs> symposium is very nice to bring us together. Otherwise, we are going to work individually, <laughs> and uh, there is a lot of beneficial to collaborate together. For example, in our the nonlinear anything, eventually we want to test in field, right? If we can get a chance to work with the uh, people or the company who have the site maintenance, we can retrofit or attach this under water cable. And I think to encourage that, we need to think from how to say research and funding agency. We need to each each side we need to think and plan together. And I like the so uh, you so I mean university most of us work on the NSF type of research, right? It's very, very fundamental. And this program the design is nice and us are to think about commercialization at the beginning, right? So it's then we team up university, industry and national lab together from our research perspective, I think that is good. We need to think about use inspired innovation instead of begin with the equations type of thing, right? We need to consider who is the final, uh, who is the user. I think funding agency, uh, now already say, already did excellent job to bring us together. Uh, another, like RPE, there's one interesting thing they did Atlantics, right? They called Atlantics 1, Atlantic 2. And then they have two phase project, and then only in second phase, they want to team up the awardee in the phase one, and the phase one, the awardee need the project exactly. team together to move forward for the next step, right? New members still can join in. I think that will be very interesting model. Right? Yeah. Thank you. I'll add uh, one small thing. The, uh, I talked about the stakeholder engagement bit of our work, and I thought that was really useful because we got to talk to all the developers and you know, everybody with a project in a New York bite, and that helped bring awareness to what we were studying. So I'd recommend that that's included in more projects. I think that's a good approach. Um, one bit that was maybe a little frustrating from that is we couldn't get a hold of some of the stakeholders we wanted to talk to, so, and, and or talk to some, uh, for example, I know like NYSERDA had like a, a ongoing landfall study and we never really connected with that team. So that's a little bit disappointing. And also like the Army Corps, we couldn't get it. You know, it's really a struggle to get a hold of them. So I don't know how we can do something, organize it a little bit better where we get those agencies maybe more involved with now RDC uh, from the beginning, maybe at an organizational level so they can just get involved with the projects that matter to them. Thank you, Jeff. And, and staying with that, uh, and um, Travis did talk about that as well, um, on what we need to do at the state level. Um, so which are the prerequisite that are needed at the federal level, the state level, uh, among uh, different stakeholders in the industry to implement your solutions and prepare for smooth transition. You touch on it a bit uh, about the challenge, but what do you think are those prerequisites that are needed at each level to make this work? Eric, why don't you go I'll, ahead? I'll start, oh, yeah. sure. <laughs> <laughs> Most so uh, we have states, we have federal, and then we have regions. And I think that the RTOs have to be at the table. I think the experience we've had so far in Massachusetts is, is that the state has, even when it has attempted to move something forward on transmission, there are so many other regional organizations that have to be at the table. 
and to weigh in that we've tried things and they haven't necessarily worked. And each time you try something that doesn't work, we learn something. And I think we're learning a lot. And I think there was this recent RFI coordinated through five of the New England states. I know there was about two years of politics leading up to that, getting people on the same page. And so I think that uh, understanding that, and then I would say the most important thing to this other point about research is that continuity and institutional memory are extremely important on large projects. So if we just keep spinning up projects with new ideas and then finishing them, who's keeping track of what happened and how they want to piece it together? So on the research end, we need to be building towards something. And maybe we build a piece that we later on don't like and we replace it out. But who's doing that? Who's actually keeping track of that? And in the same way, in terms of the dialogue with the states, imagine you bring the stakeholders to the table and every time they show up, they have a different representative. Somebody's left the company. Somebody new comes in. I mean, that's where we spend a lot of time. And these things happen. But if we have an awareness that we're creating a collective institutional memory and that we're creating a consistency over time, that we're working at a scale that we're not used to working at, I think it may change the way that we think about convening. And so I would just recommend that we maintain an awareness of that. Okay. Anyone else want to, want to jump in? OK, so I'm going to transition then to the audience question. And this one is for Rajib. Um, what is the overall efficiency of the offshore wind system? Uh, and would changing the transmission design offshore improve efficiency using different frequencies? It's a loaded question because you know there is no one single efficiency number. I mean, if you if you look at um, just each stage of power conversion. So if you if you take today's turbines, right? Um, you know the generator, depending on what condition it's running, its efficiency can go from you know. 95, 96, 97 percent in that range depends on the technology. Uh, power converter efficiency for each stage of power conversion today, uh, you can typically take a ballpark number of 98.5 to 99 percent. Um, so the power converter itself, that's on the on a wind tower, it's about 97 percent or 97.5 percent efficient. Transformers are more efficient typically. But then their you know, partial load efficiency is, is not good. Uh, so if you, if, you, if you kind of you know, uh, take the product of all that, right, coming out of a turbine, your efficiency is in the low 90s, right? The, the offshore, you know, if you take HVDC, conventional HVDC today, the power converter itself is actually very, very efficient. The, the, the voltage source converters today run at efficiencies of 99.5 plus percent, right? Um, but then you have the transformer, obviously there is cable efficiency. Um, now what happens is that you have to, when we, when we compare, you know, what we, are, when, what we are proposing on the MVDC side, we are kind of, you know, cutting down on at least one large transformer efficiency uh, bucket from the offshore substation. Um, we are improving the efficiency of the collector system. So we, uh, I mean, the ballpark that we have seen is that we can get about, say, one and a half to two percent efficiency improvement just on that offshore side, uh, which, in the grand scheme of things, is not negligible. You know, it, and and it, typically, what you should really look at is kind of from the energy production standpoint and see the impact of LCOE because, as I said, the efficiency, it, it's not a base load that you are running, right? Your, your, your generation is fluctuating, so your efficiency will go up, and go up and down. So you have to really look at the overall energy production, how much uh, you're impacting, essentially, the energy generation by improving in efficiency. Mm -hmm. right? and that should impact the LCOE. Thank you, Rajiv. And this one is for Travis. Uh, are there any considerations for connecting future wave energy to the electrical system getting developed in Oregon and California or generally? Well, there is there certainly is work to, to mature, you know, wave energy conversion, tidal conversion, tidal, tidal energy converter, tidal energy generators, um, actually at the Packwave facility in Oregon. 
maybe the question is related to the offshore wind transmission concepts. I mean, I think that it's, I mean, there is an active work that I'm aware of in that area, but there is nothing to say that if there was some sort of offshore, you know, transmission system, that it could not link, you know, there could be an AC collector system where something like that could integrate. The thing is, <clears throat> where would that where would that device be located? Typically, I think those things are closer to shore than where we're, we're considering putting offshore wind turbines. Those call areas are anywhere from 15 to 65 miles offshore. So I'm not sure. I mean, if they're co-located with the HVDC infrastructure that might run north south, and there was a way to collect, maybe an AC collector system, then potentially it'd be nice to it's nice to consider like a, a highway, you know. Which, which, might, which might give you flexibility in moving power north and south. And that, that provides some, especially in the wildfire context, you know, that provides an alternative that might hold value. It'd be very expensive. It's a, that's a major investment, a major you know, infrastructure campaign, series of campaigns. But um, you know, anything's possible. I, no direct studies of that, of linking that to an offshore transmission grid if you will, that I'm aware of today, but it could be done. Great. Jeff, there were a lot of questions uh, <laughs> about the shared landfill, um, but the theme there is really on reliability, um, the number of uh, cables and circuits uh, to put in, in those conduits. So in terms of reliability, thermal, um, so one of the questions were, was how do you design for reliability in these corridors with such high power density and if you considered vertical configurations as well and uh, the single largest contingency <laughs> in that matter. Just, yeah. I'm giving you all of it okay. <laughs> in one. But <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a common theme that was brought up when we were talking to developers. Uh, I did go on like sort of a hunt talking to regulatory agencies about what, how would, um, are there any single contingency limits that actually apply to this? I couldn't really get a straight answer of any rules would actually apply to, let's say, having all cables in the same road, for instance, like having six gigawatts running through one road. Yeah, obviously, if there's like a missile strike or something, like it's going to take it all off, right? But to what extent do you, do you design for, for events like that? It's hard to say. Um, yeah, let me let me think about what else to say on this. Um, the well, okay. So, first of all, couldn't really find any rules that are out there. I think the second thing is the um, you know we try we will take account of security in so far as we can, but I think the the idea is really to put uh, as many megawatts as we can, and obviously we want to we want things to be physically secure. We also have to think about things like theft. Um, we did want to keep things like uh, if there's a fault, it's not going to affect the neighbor's cables. We know that the developers don't want, they'll be reluctant to use a piece of infrastructure if they know the neighboring project that's less than a meter away is going to affect them, both from a thermal perspective, operational perspective, maintenance perspective, reliability perspective. So we do have that in mind, but it's a challenge when you're trying to work with small spaces, right? Um, I'd have the same question to like, we, we haven't gone on to this topic yet, but like, you know, the con eds or super hub, it's been talked about and like f putting four gigawatts or six gigawatts in a Farragut, I'd argue there's very much like the same reliability issue there um, because you have a lot of transformers in one space, you have a lot of buses in one space, you have a lot of injection into one spot. It's not all that different from a lot of export cables in one road, so. Can I hop in there? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I've talked to NERC a little bit about, and I, of course I don't come from NERC, I can't represent NERC in any way, but I will just relay that it's clear from discussions with NERC that there needs to be some clarification in terms of how the TPL standards, for example, will apply to subsea cables or common corridor, corridors for cable runs. Uh, and there's the standard authorization request process. So there's a way to potentially ask for that and we're working on that as part of the, the DOE kind of transmission convening team <coughs> in the Atlantic. Um, you know, what does that standard authorization request need to look like? You know, NERC is interested in what are the failure modes potentially, and then what, what kind of data do we have to understand the likelihood of, the, of occurrence? So I think there's, there's room to maybe get clarity in the future, but I think that would really help the industry, not just with your concept, but in general with uh, common routes. Thank you. Um, 
Eric, you talked about mac macrograds. Uh, how does that deal with islands like Ercot and are there any um, data to address and help on the cost allocation? Uh, the, you said the cost allocation and the first part of the question was how does that deal with ERCOT? Oh, with ERCOT. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they left ERCOT out of those, <laughs> of those pictures. So I think it's a question of how much does ERCOT want to talk to others. Um, and the question of cost allocation, I mean, these are, these are federal projects. And, you know, I think the Northwest-Southwest intertie that Travis was talking about is, is, an, is an exemplar of a really large scale, high capacity HVDC corridor. Uh, we have other HVDC corridors that you know that we've constructed over time. Some in New England, coming down from Quebec into into New York. So, I think that um, part of this is recognizing that we are doing something new, and so the system within which we do something new is also going to have to change itself so that it can do something new. Uh, and so, for instance, you talk about reliability and you talk about these things. I mean, the way we, so for this building, for instance, this building was designed for a, an earthquake. There are earthquakes in this part of the country, by the way, but they have a 2% chance of occurring in 50 years. So there's a hazard. And then the building is supposed to have at least a 10% chance, just no more than a 10% chance of collapse given that earthquake. And then there's a risk. And that those risk levels are set. And so we know how to do this in, a, in probabilistic frameworks. And the question is then is what what are the hazards what are the failure modes what are the demands and then how do we how do we put that together and so i think that um having a in the power systems industry particularly related to the energy transition with the acknowledgement that we're going to be building very high capacity corridors 10 gigawatt plus corridors in order to make these things happen how then does one design the system to satisfy those those criteria and so i think that i think that you know, that comes up. Um, and this grid is going to be, it's gonna cost a lot of money. You know, so I think that's, th that if you look at who built the Northwest Southwest intertie though, there's like 10 ent separate entities, yeah. you know, in the 1930s to the 1960s who collaborated there. So I, I think there may be things that we can mm -hmm. learn, you know, by looking back a few decades. I don't think we can learn a lot on an environmental level by looking back a few decades, but in terms of convening and in terms of collaborative models and the role of the federal government, I think the last 40 years we have not had a very strong understanding of how the federal government can play in this. We've just had a completely different cultural frame. So I think we have to, we have to acknowledge these things and then talk about them and, and actually allow ourselves to think maybe more historically, mm -hmm. how do you put a project like that together? Good, thank you. Um, I'm going to end up with this question with Dr. Lee before giving you all the on opportunity to wrap up. So Dr. Lee, uh, what would you say are the biggest challenges and how are you thinking about overcoming them for your project implementation? Dr. Lee, did I say it wrong? Dr. Lee? Oh, you? Lee? No. Okay. Oh. Oh, oh yeah. I, I didn't get it that okay. I was thinking something else. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's a long day. Uh, <laughs> You're almost there. Uh, so what would you say are your biggest challenges and what are your ideas to overcome them for your project to be implemented? Okay. Uh, let me say that way. The big challenge, I mentioned several risks, right? And the biophony is not really the really risk. And uh, I, in the slides, I put out the minor risk. Okay. One risk is the fluid structure interaction, right? If you consider the cable vibration and you put another uh, mass outside, and one important thing, this, this additional interaction between the two mass and uh, this uh, cable itself, right? Uh, so uh, previously our preliminary work we did is we have cable, not cable, but <laughs> the sense moving mass is inside. Inside the moving mass, there's a no, this, this mass will not interact the fluid. Now we put this mass outside for the convenience to the retrofit insulation. Technically, that is not easy because the additional interaction with the time wearing this velocity, the technical challenge itself. And uh, so, if we, uh, other than that, the retrofit and uh, insulation 
everything should be. I I feel pretty confident if uh, we can address the fluid structure intention, additional fluid structure intention. This this approach can be as popular as the overhead power line, the tuned modem. Probably we can almost say every. If you drive on the, or along the highway, you can see such kind of small things on the cable. I hope that can be a solution that can be used for undersea cable. Okay, sorry about that. Okay. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. So just to wrap it up, I would ask each one of you for one minute or less um, <laughs> to kind of talk about what would be the next step uh, to make this work. We're talking about coordinating solutions, but what is one or two steps that you would recommend that we take action on starting today? One minute or less. Down the line? Is that Down the, the line. line. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys get a little more time to think. <laughs> um, what I would say is, you know, it's just such a, I think everyone in this room would agree that given where we want to go, transmission is so vital. And I think, that, and it's going to be expensive, as Eric mentioned. You know, I mean, there's no doubt about that. So I think it's very important that we consider the values which accrue to to many types of entities, right? Many people, you know, across through interregional transmission, and we really do a lot of work on the value piece, like considering, you know, resilience events, considering reliability, uh, considering markets and power prices. Um, I think that piece is critical because we know what the costs, we, or I guess we're proving the supply chain and we, we can get an idea of costs, I think maybe a little bit quicker than we can value. And I think we really need to think about the upside and, and telling that story and doing it interregionally. In a lot of ways, offshore wind is sort of the canary in the coal mine, I hate the coal mine metaphor, but it's, it's kind of the, the leading wave, I think, you know, for all this transmission that we need to develop in this country. So I think Eric made that point pretty well. So I think it's it's an opportunity. We have an opportunity to try to try to have that that communication that communication tell that story on an interregional basis in in the Atlantic. That's where it's starting. That's where the real opportunity is right now. So it's I'm excited about mostly the work you guys are all doing, but uh, the opportunity ahead of us in the Atlantic. Thank you, Travis. All right. yeah. Mike. Sure. Thanks. So our first priority is to create these tools that help us visualize different scenarios and the scenario that everyone uh, would like to see and rightly so what does it look like if you don't do anything and you know what how, how far can you go and then at what point do you just give out and then what does it look like if you coordinate it so i think our entire project can be boiled down to an attempt to create a uh, a legible compelling contrast between those two cases at different scales and then I would say it's very important for us as a country to come to terms with what is our goal for 2050. It needs to be something that all of us can understand, and then it needs to be something in which we understand the big pieces of the puzzle that fit together and how those happen. And then I would say there is this sort of continuous engagement between the states, the RTOs, the regions, and the feds. This has got to happen constantly. And we really are in a cycle of iterative legislation, certainly in Massachusetts. Every couple of years, we pass a new bill because everything's changing. You know, and it, it, there's nothing wrong with that. It makes perfect sense, given the way that things are, things are changing. And then I would say that once we have those in place, the real work begins because it becomes a question of what do we do next, and how do we actually optimize our pathways to getting to 2050. So right now, you know, my concern is, is that we don't even have an agreement on what it is that we're trying to build in 2050. And we need to have that first, and then we can start to think about how we get there and maybe what we build changes over time. But I think we need, we kind of need a both and place, and then we need to really talk about each step we take is going to be critical, and we're going to need to have a very fast, very effective way of making high quality decisions that have the right stakeholders involved. Thank you, Eric. Please. Okay, uh, I would say the important thing for the success next step will be partnership. And uh, I have been in industry for four years, in, comp uh, in university for 14 years. Okay, I fear in university publish a lot of papers, but a lot of things wouldn't go too far. So I think the knowledge transferred to the industry application is very, very critical. Otherwise, Paper, people cite the paper, that wouldn't go anywhere, right? 
and our work we will not see the industry impact. So to do that, I hope that in, this also in the past years before pandemic time, I travel a lot, try to know um, different people from different universities, different uh, industry area, and to know each other so that we can have a chance to come up with up a solution that can be applied to industry. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm just going to talk in the context of the shared landfall project. So, um, uh, one thing I, when I came up with the project, actually, it was uh, kind of in, in, say, not complementary to offshore mesh network. I was actually thinking, like, how could we come up with something that is a little bit less ambitious than coordinated offshore network? Because I was like, I'm a skeptic, you know, it's just, I, it's too much to take on. So, that's why I was saying about shared landfall, okay, less, less CapEx investment, this kind of thing. But actually, now that I've stopped to think about it and with things going on with NYSERDA and all, you know, it's actually, it does complement, um, shared landfall can complement like a coordinated offshore network solution. So, you know, I think the next step I'd like to see is, um, yeah, how it could be integrated with whatever NYSERDA is doing or whatever Kaiso is doing, or, or whoever, when whoever's looking at these offshore uh, grid networks. I mean, landfall is a big issue, and they're going to have to take in, in, into account new solutions for it. So, I think in the context of the project that uh, we are just finishing up, um, uh, you know, the the concept feasibility has been established, um, but these are very huge investments if you want to really go and build a pilot project. But there are a lot of steps before that. Um, certainly a good next step would be to uh, do some large scale uh, real time simulation kind of demonstration. Um, maybe build some very scaled hardware uh, where we can prove the concepts. And, and that I think we can see as kind of the logical next step that we have to really go through in, in order to make any kind of uh, meaningful impact. In the larger context, I think, you know, if I look at, you know, the challenge that Eric kind of showed in that one or two pages, it's actually very real. And the question is, you, you cannot just shortcut it and get there, right? <coughs> there is got to be pretty significant challenges and got to be very significant investments to get there, right? Um, as a technical community who are working to make these things happen, one thing we can do, obviously we do our job well, but I think there is a much stronger coordination that I feel that's needed. Um, and the better we can do, faster we can do, um, it, you know, it, it's for our all good. The, the other thing that in the context of HPDC, which has come up um, several times in our discussion today, which I think is absolutely required, um, if you look at, you know, HPDC actually to a great extent started, you know, the very initial projects G did, you know, many, many years back, right, in the 70s and, you know, with market art rectifiers and so on. Right? Uh, the, the first HPDC line was a 10 kV or 15 kV line in Schenectady that was built as an experimental line. Uh, but the competitiveness today in U.S. regard to that technology is not there, and what is more scary is that we really do not have even the workforce in that industry, right? So I think to my, you know, academic friends, you know, it is very important to actually build the next generation of the power engineers um, who are motivated, right? to work in these fields um, and and also build test infrastructures. This is not something that you can, you know, do in your garage, right? You, you really need uh, large test infrastructures. You know, the way China had actually excelled in HVDC, and I've been there in many of these labs, it is just unimaginable the amount of investment that they had done to build that infrastructure. Unless and until we get there, I think we can show charts, but it's not going to happen, right? right. So. Thank you. Thank you, Rajiv. Thank you, uh, Jeff. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Eric. And thank you, Travis. Uh, special thanks to Corey from the Now RDC for allowing me to moderate my first panel.
Um, but I'll leave with this. Uh, let's keep the momentum. We still have a lot of work to do, but any small win, big or small, is a win. So let's keep it up and let's materialize all this action that we talked about today. So thank you, everyone, for <laughs> staying to the end. Uh, really appreciate and, and thank you for being here today. So let's give a round of applause. To all our